G.I. Joe's greatest spy embarks on a deadly solo mission for the Urashi Kage clan to steal a rare and dangerous weapon from the Mugenonami clan. Can she survive a gauntlet of armed guards, dizzying falls, and sharks? Let's find out in our review of Scarlet Number 3 from Image Comics. See you in 3. Welcome back to Comical Opinions. This is our review of Scarlet Number 3. Writer Kelly Thompson takes readers on a thrill ride adventure by sending Scarlet on an impossible mission to steal a heavily guarded thing. I'm just going to say it like that. It's just a thing. If that sentence sounds confusing, that's intentional. Scarlet number three works if you pay attention to the spirit of action and adventure, but the key ingredient that's missing from the story are the stakes. What good is a dangerous action comic when you don't know what you're fighting for? But before we dig into this issue, let's recap what happened briefly in Scarlet number two. Her attempts to at becoming a trusted member of the Arishikage involved escaping locked rooms, killing low-level ninjas, and keeping a very safe but watchful distance from Jinx because they don't want to tip off that they know each other. The issue ended with the hard master sending Scarlet on a final test to infiltrate the rival gang, in this case it's the Mugenonami clan, and enter an ultra secure skyscraper to steal a rare and precious weapon. What exactly is this weapon? We don't know. That brings us to Scarlet number three. We pick up with Scarlet from the end of issue number two. She haloed into the roof of the Sato to the Tiger, that's the name of the building. When her arrival was noticed by guards, she leaps from the central atrium down to the lobby below, or at least that's what it looked like. Now we see she somehow leapt into the stories tall fish tank in the center of the building's lobby. Avoiding sharks and the armed guards, Scarlet enters an access panel at the bottom of the, of the columnar tank to weave her way through the building's service corridors. Right off, you sense that there's some kind of disconnect between issues number two and three. When Scarlet leaped off the upper floor landing in issue number two, there was no hint that she was jumping into a large fish tank. Also, why would you jump into a tank when you're fully visible by the guards and your progress toward the only access panel, which is at the very bottom, would be greatly slowed by the crushing pressure from all the water beating down on your body. Enough pressure to probably kill a human being. It's not very smart, but it looks kind of cool, which is probably the only reason Kelly Thompson invented this scene. In short, it's cool, but dumb. Scarlet snakes her way through blind corners, narrow hallways, and darkened doorways. She encounters Mugenonami resistance and their guards, which are basically men dressed in suits while wielding samurai swords. Scarlet is able to dispatch the men with her sword while completely missing the men in close-quartered narrow hallways with her Uzi submachine guns. During one of the brief skirmishes, Scarlet is cut on her right flank by a sword, so she's bleeding and injured, but not crippled. Again, Kelly Thompson is opting for the do something cool, even if it doesn't make sense approach for Scarlet. If you're in a small, narrow, close-quartered hallway and three men are coming at you with swords, how do you miss them while you're spraying the hallway with Uzi gunfire? Why are the guards of an ultra-secure high-rise that have very valuable things that they want to guard only equipped with swords? You get these little oddities that pile up and stack up, and the more you think about it, the more you realize, again, it looks cool, but it's kind of dumb. Scarlet eventually arrives at the deepest sublevels containing the power generators. Why is she after power generators? If she disables the power, she shuts down the laser field around the special thing, whatever it happens to be, that Jinx, Storm Shadow, and the Rishikage ninjas are trying to steal in the next building over. The building is called Sato 3. After a tussle with some more guards that are coming at her from different doorways and down gangplanks, Scarlet blows up the generators. The issue concludes with an impressive trek back the way she came up to the roof of the building, completely unimpeded? Question mark. I don't know. A daring bit of grappling work, looks very impressive, and a helicopter with a familiar symbol arriving to claim the prize. Overall, the issue is packed with non-stop action, adventure, excitement, all the things that you're looking for out of anything related to G.I. Joe. However, the moment you pause and start to think about what just happened, you immediately realize that things happen that don't make sense just for the sake of looking cool. And after three issues, with two left to go, this is a five-part miniseries, you still have no idea what Scarlet is after. She's been told to steal a thing that could be a weapon, but we have no idea what it is. So how are you supposed to set the stakes when you don't know what she's after? All right, that's enough of that. Let's talk about the art. Marco Ferrari's art is, I guess the best way you could put it, it's fine for the story being told. It's not great art, and it's not terrible art. Ferrari's visuals are just, just sort of okay. There's a squiggly, 
component to his line work that keeps the action from looking sharp. You want it to be sharp. You want it to be hard hitting. You want that fine focus precision because this is a, you know, at the end of the day, a military comic. But you don't get that here just because of the looseness of the straight lines and the curvatures. It's not quite as bad as, like, say, for example, a Riley Rosmo Twinkle Toes kind of figure work comic, but there's enough of it that it just dips slightly into cartoonish, which is okay, but not great. Let's take a step back and look at the big picture. If you've been reading this title with the expectation that this miniseries fits within the interconnected Energon universe from Skybound, we can neither confirm nor deny that is the case. I'm not saying that to be cheeky, it's just that so far, nothing that's occurred in this story has anything to do with Energon or the Transformers or the intersection of the Transformers and, and G.I. Joe. It's part of that universe from the label, but where it connects in, we don't know. Now, it is possible that the rare thing, whatever it happens to be, that everyone is after is some kind of Cybertronian tech. But that would just be a guess. Otherwise, this is a one-off story centering on a member of G.I. Joe that has no apparent connection to anything else that's going on in the other Energon titles. So final thoughts, what do we think about Scarlet number three? Readers get taken on a non-stop action ride from start to finish with G.I. Joe's Greatest Spy, which is a good thing. We want that. That said, much of the action is nonsensical and the central premise lacks stakes because neither Scarlet nor the readers, which is you and me, know what she's trying to steal. Further, the art is, just to be blunt, it's just okay. On the whole, this is Skybound's weakest Energon title by far. Therefore, Scarlet number 3 earns a 5 out of 10. We want to give everything from Skybound a high score, but just can't do it this time. Just can't. But what do you think? Are you enjoying this series so far? Give us a thumbs up if you are, and leave us a comment below with which G.I. Joe or Transformer character you want to see get their own solo miniseries. Also, remember to click on the link in the description to read the written review and buy this comic to help support the channel. That would be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for joining, and stay tuned through the outro for more reviews just like this one.